Awesome. Hello, hello, everybody, and welcome to our panel on trans healthcare awareness and access. Um, we are thrilled to have you joining us here this afternoon um, in what is a very hot Saturday afternoon, but a very nice one nonetheless. Uh, my name is Faye Johnstone. I use she and they pronouns, and I have the privilege of being the moderator for this panel today. Uh, in a moment, I'll hand it over to our phenomenal panelists, let them, in, let them introduce themselves. Um, but in terms of myself, I use she, they pronouns. I am based on unceded, unsurrendered Algonquin territory, as I believe many, if not all of us, or most of us are. Uh, and before we get started, I would uh, encourage all of us to reflect on our relationship to this land, um, to the land that we're gathered upon today. Um, when we talk about gender and sexuality, we often put things into silos and buckets. And by doing that, we don't do justice to how our experiences are interconnected. Um, homophobia, transphobia need to be analyzed alongside and in connection to colonialism. Uh, and throughout our time together on this panel today and in all aspects of our work, I would encourage us to bring that lens forward, um, reflect on our own relationship to this land and how we might be able to do more and or better in terms of solidarity and justice for folks whose land we are at, in fact residing upon. Now, I'll let us get into the panel in just a moment, but if you are new to, uh, to the live stream function, just so you know our run of show for today, um, we, there should be closed captions hanging out at the bottom of your screen or subtitles. Um, and I believe there will be space for questions later on today. Um, and so we do have a bit of time set aside at the end for that. Uh, please be mindful on that front that uh, folks have a right to privacy. And so be mindful about the questions that you ask as well. Uh, and please know that if you ask a question that we're like, ah, about, I might just like take that question, hold it, and then like push it over that way for a bit. <laughs> um, just so that you all know what our plan is for today. Uh, lastly, before we kick things off more formally, I do want to thank Capital Pride for hosting today. I also want to thank the interpreters and captioners who have joined us this afternoon. Uh, and I also want to thank Safety, who this event is brought to you uh, alongside. And with that, maybe Ollie, I'll turn it over to you first if you'd like to introduce yourself and then tell us a bit about Safety. Absolutely. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is uh, Oliver Ollie Thorne. Uh, my pronouns are they and he, and I am a proud facilitator for Safety Ottawa, uh, Support and Education for Trans Youth Ottawa. It's one of the only by and for trans youth groups and ab advocacy collective here. And uh, what that means to us is that we run uh, our events for trans youth, we use youth very broadly. Um, so if you identify as a youth, you're welcome to come. Uh, unfortunately, with the pandemic, these events have been put on hold, but our advocacy continues behind the scenes. Um, in 2018, we uh, asked a survey from the community about their experiences with the gender uh, diversity clinic here at the CHIO, the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario, and have since put out a community report on the experiences and the next steps that we see for uh, trans healthcare for youth within the city um, and beyond, to be honest. Um, hopefully, once this uh, scare and uh, pandemic kind of uh, toned down as much as it possibly can, uh, we'll be holding events soon for uh, uh, trans folks of all ages and uh, specifically youth uh, to come and join. Um, but uh, yeah, I am a facilitator there as well as a master's student at Carleton in Indigenous and Canadian Studies and currently working on my master's research project and uh, great, uh, very happy to be here today. Awesome, thanks so much, Ollie. Uh, Keegan, do you wanna introduce yourself next? Yeah, sure. So, hey, everybody. My name is Keegan Prempe. My pronouns are they, them, or Z, sir. Um, yeah, I'm super happy to be here today. Um, right now, my gay, my <laughs> my day gig is anonymous HIV testing at Somerset West Community Health Center. But in the past, I've done peer support and health navigation with transgender and diverse communities. Um, done like organizing around like um, pride in the city and um, just a whole lot of things. Um, I am a bachelor of social work. Um, I'm really interested in you know, transformative justice in you know kind of shifting systems and you know creating better spaces for us to live and play in and so i'm happy to be here today to kind of share about my experiences kind of share my knowledge um you know just and chat with these lovely people here on the call with me so it's nice to be here thanks awesome thanks so much kicking happy to have you here and last but of course not least riley over to you Hi everyone, my name is Riley Nielsen. My pronouns are they, them, theirs. I'm calling in from Halifax, um, which is unlike everyone else, located in Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. We are all treaty people. Uh, I am the author of a new policy on trans and intersex and gender diverse healthcare and a trans community policy activist. Uh, 
and a political organizer. My day job, I work in the field of sexualized violence to make sure that we create systems in which everyone, regardless of race, class, gender, identity, or ability can access uh, legal support if they have been the victim of sexualized violence and creating a system in which everyone can access fair and equitable treatment under the law. Well, and I am also, uh, I have an MPA, a master's of public administration, and I'm a current master's uh, of arts and political science student at Dalhousie University. Very cool. And thank you for joining us all the way from Halifax. It's good to have some interprovincial perspectives. Um, so without further ado, we'll, we'll kick this thing off with our first question. Um, as folks know, there's a lot in the world of trans health. So we definitely will not be able to touch on like each and everything. Um, but our hope is to engage and, you know, highlight some of the barriers, talk about what we could be doing differently, uh, and explore what other folks could be doing in this work too. Uh, and so with that in mind, and, and we're going to do this popcorn style, so folks, panelists, feel free to just jump on in when you're ready. Um, from your experience, personally or professionally, what are some of the barriers that are often faced by trans folks while accessing even just general health care, right? Like showing up in an emergency room, seeing your family doc. What are some of the things that we know can go wrong in those moments? Um, I will start. Um, as a province like Nova Scotia, we already suffer from a lack of healthcare providers, specifically doctors here in the province. Our wait list is months, if not years long for some people, and it's even longer for individuals who are a member of the trans community. Uh, if everyone's limited and then you have an extra limitation on top of that, it's nearly impossible to find healthcare, especially in provinces like Nova Scotia, PEI, and anywhere else on the Atlantic coast. Part of the problem even more is there's no education or training or even any experience that healthcare providers have here on supporting members of the community, which makes it even more difficult because even if you can find a doctor or healthcare provider, they're likely not going to be able to help you on your specific issues, which defeats the purpose of having a dedicated family health practitioner. There's also no incentives to provide this, provide this care or education, either at the provincial level or at the provider level or the union level. There's no incentives currently. Uh, it's made even worse. A lot of us live in rural areas of our provinces and access is even further limited on top of the limitations that come with providing health care in rural areas or any level of service in rural areas, um, especially if you're a closeted trans person and you live in a small community where there's one doctor, you're no longer able to remain anonymous and in the closet for your own protection. On top of that, the places that can provide our health care are stretched so thin because demand is so high that even if you can get into the example here, sexual wellness centers here in Nova Scotia, the time that you do get with a health practitioner is so limited as to, as to be non-existent. You might as not, not be getting health care. Um, I currently am technically a patient of a sexual health center, and I've never even met the person who's supposed to be providing my aftercare for more than a 10 minute phone conversation with them. Mm -hmm. And that's not likely to improve any time without any uh, cultural shifts within government and policy. Oh, thank you. And I think that like, I, I, I'm already hearing like the echoes of what we see here in Ontario and even in Ottawa. So I wonder, Ollie and Keegan, uh, what are your thoughts on top of that? What are, how, does, is the context here similar? Yeah, I mean, I would say a lot of well, a lot of what Riley said really resonated with me. Like, you know, Ottawa is like certainly like a bigger, you know, we've got like a million people here or something. Technically, we are the province um, of Nova Scotia. Yeah, <laughs> um, exactly. Um, even though, but there are a lot still like you know more rural areas in like within the Ottawa region. Um, but yeah, there's just like a lot of providers who really don't know what they're doing and don't care, um, and who <laughs> now don't, don't really want to change. Um, and I know one thing that really comes up for me is that a lot of people are terrified just like so terrified to access care. So even when in theory, I know of a, a physician or nurse practitioner or whoever that like maybe isn't horrific, is like a five out of 10 horrific, like people are still like, nope, I'm not going. I've you know done that rodeo a few times. It's been traumatizing a bunch of times and I'm just not doing it anymore. And so, you know, you have people who maybe their issues are maybe, you know, more insular or like kind of acute in nature at the beginning, but then, you know, they go years maybe without ever seeing any, without getting any type of care, regardless of whether it's like transition related or not. And then all of a sudden, you know, they've got these complex chronic conditions that are just a lot worse than they were before, but people are just terrified. And it's really frustrating because I've been, you know, you know, kind of in the work that I've done with different physicians or healthcare providers, you know, there's like this really like big, like, oh, we want to help, we want to help, we want to help, you know, but like people won't even come in the door to get the help that you're providing you know what i mean and so like how i think a lot about how 
you know, people die, people die, people get really shitty chronic conditions that maybe they didn't necessarily wouldn't have had if they'd gotten the help they needed like seven years ago, 10 years ago, five months ago, who knows? Um, and it's really disheartening because, you know, and then a lot of the time I think where trans people often see is like non-compliant, like, oh, well, you didn't show up, you know, for your appointments, you didn't go get your medication. Well, it's like, well, I tried. And then the pharmacist misgendered me and was asking me a bunch of questions about why I was taking this like boys medication. And so I was like, fuck that. I'm never coming back here. Um, and then you're seen as the problem in the, you know, kind of in the situation. So that's kind of like one thing I see as well. Yeah. I think that like, even I, I, I think like healthcare doesn't factor in its own history, right? Like there is a history of negative experience. And I actually think one of the biggest things we, we need to see is, is a process of acknowledging and naming that history because that shapes why people have shitty experiences or, or prohibit themselves from accessing services because of those histories. Um, Ollie, what do you think? Yeah, Faye, that was a great segue. So for something that I see is like a lot of these providers don't understand or don't have never known the history of trans healthcare and like how it came to kind of be and like how a lot of these structures are still ingrained within our society today. But like, well, yeah, yeah, like I see you for you, but I'm like, yeah, but you're still thinking about a linear way of transitioning or like assuming that I'm going to medically transition at all. And like, that's clearly not the case. Like, please listen to me. Um, Specifically from what we see with like, uh, kids is that a lot of healthcare providers just like are so scared to deal, to treat, to understand trans children. And so instead of being like, all right, like, let's see the steps that we can take. Maybe I can educate myself. This kid is nine. They're not going to be doing any hormones anytime soon. It's just a conversation, right? But instead they get shipped off to these gender clinics to which the wait times are so long. You don't know what's going on. Like it, it, it's, um, a lot of the times and we've seen with like even like the safety report about how like who are these gender clinics really catering to are they catering to the child themselves or maybe the parents even more because we see that the the way the parents rated uh the gender clinics experiences look higher on average than the child and so that tells something in and of itself and so these wait lists and even in uh so because of covid i know folks who are trying to uh get care through uh the community centers However, uh, when one the, their one trans uh, person who does the intakes goes on to bigger and better things, the inability to fill that spot, and now people are waiting, they're waiting months to get onto this wait list, and then now they've been told indefinitely that they don't know when they're gonna be seeing a doctor, right? And these are people who are too scared or uh, have experienced transphobia within their doctors themselves. So they have to outsource their own care already, right? And so, um, and again, even the times that they do see these community spaces, like it's as what Riley said, it's gonna be like a 10 minute phone call. And how are you supposed to understand like that, that, that person as your patient, as your client uh, within those that, that small experience? And then the biggest thing too that I see, and especially in these conversations of trans healthcare, like I specifically wanted people from the, the community for this conversation, right? I didn't necessarily need any quote experts or what has been labeled experts as uh, seen as doctors, because what are they What are they really experts in? Are they experts in trans healthcare? Or are they experts in specifically this level of hormone and this person, you know? And so I think like defining what we mean by experts uh, in trans healthcare and not letting doctors and social uh, workers and um, social services know that the real experts are trans people and always have been and that they just needs to uh, the listening and the uh, listening and actively engaging in what we're saying uh, I think uh, can only benefit uh, them as well as us right and so mm-hmm. you know, unfortunately that is not <laughs> and what I've seen in my my time has not always been the case in that listening you know I think it's actually like I have my MSW and like social work, you know, inundates you with like, you know, agency. It's always about the client. It's always about the patient. And then it's like we get so caught up in, in what that actually means and looks like. Uh, when I, like, I spend so much of my time just like training service providers and social workers on 2S LGBTQ inclusion. And 90 percent of it is you already have most of the skills. You know how to do this. You like trans health is not some like like fourth, like 49th rail. I don't know what the, you know. It's not like way out there, it is in your practice. It is stuff you already know how to do. And you don't actually need to memorize every gender. You just need to know how to be nice to somebody and respectful and ground your work in their needs. Mm -hmm. So I wonder, I wanna kind of continue this conversation before we jump to our next question. So Riley, did you wanna jump on in? Yeah, I think part of the issue is that we're so pathologized Um, as much as uh, people claim that we aren't anymore. We're still treated as clinically mentally ill and needing a protection from ourselves. And I know we've been focusing on healthcare in general, but I think it's most clearly seen in how gender affirming care is treated 
globally, and including here in Canada, is not seen as medically necessary. We're required to prove to someone else, usually if you're in a province like Nova Scotia, you have to prove to two or three people that you are trans enough to access these care. And 90% of the time, these people are not trans, they're cisgender, they're straight, and they're white. And they usually are not someone with a disability. So not only does that create a situation in which we're having to prove our transness to people, an external person who has no context for our experience, even when people do get through the system, it creates a disparity where uh, people who are white and able-bodied and not neurodivergent are getting approved at like 10 times higher rates than anyone else and is creating a system of systemic racism, homophobia, and ableism that just further traumatizes people. And even the people who aren't traumatized from that aspect of it are traumatized just from going through this process. I know myself because of the procedures and care that I need for my gender affirming care. Uh, the person who was supposed to be doing my assessment asked me if I was trans enough to receive care. Uh, a friend of mine who is a trans woman, a trans lesbian, got asked if she was just a man with a fetish for wanting to transition. And these are people who are specifically trained to support us and to help us. And these are other kind of questions that we're being asked in spaces that are supposed to be about us and focused on our care, but not only are we forced to prove that we deserve to exist in that process, we're continuously traumatized in it. Um, the focus right now um, I know it's a focus, especially in my province, and I know it's a focus everywhere else too, is that healthcare providers and those who are involved in the public health system are more, they're more focused on reducing costs to government at the expense of trans welfare and not focus on the livelihood of the individuals requiring care. It's seen as cosmetic, we're seen as mentally ill, and we're seen as had to go through 10 more hurdles in a system that's supposed to be providing the care to let us live our best life. Instead, it is gatekeeping us, it's denying us access. None of our own community are involved in the other side of the process. And how can we expect to have any level of trans inclusion in the healthcare system if we're constantly excluded from it, both when we're trying to access care and on the other end of care provision and approval? Mm -hmm. And I think it's interesting, like, I, again, like, social workers don't even receive that much more training on trans inclusion than, like, probably more than physicians do. But even then, I think it's interesting that there's these hoops set up where you have to get, like, I could technically write a referral letter. And like, I don't, I can't even imagine, like, that as a context, but like, what knowledge do I have over somebody else who is like, a like another trans person? Like, what, what's going on there? Yeah. Yeah. And it's uh, like, I'm being Raleigh going to the point who is the experts right and like something that uh riley said like uh something that safety stands for is the depathologization of trans identities and that's like something that we like that is huge right and like the context of like stop assessing us right this concept of we constantly need assessment to prove or to see that we're trans enough like what does that mean will we would quote regret these irreversible changes newsflash everything is like irreversible in one way or another bodies <laughs> change <laughs> change everything is a phase like i can like when i talked like i've started to shift the way i talk about like gender stuff and comparing it just like being like well like this is a non-binary person this is a trans person being like okay like you as a cis woman like how many different phases did you go about expressing your gender identity how did that work for you what did you feel you know because it's for everybody however we're the only ones that are uh questioned and are like sometimes with like especially kids like uh, puberty's paused, but then not uh, like gone in the direction that they want because they need more time. And you're like, who? Right? I've been told recently about a young girl who was so excited to start estrogen, but her T levels were too high, which like, I was like, okay, what does that mean? Like, why does that matter? We still can have estrogen in our bodies, right? And she was also told that she was not mentally prepared for it or mentally well enough for it, this young child. And you're just like, and so that like really hit her heart, right? So she doesn't know when she's gonna get it and this, that, and the other. And like, who determined that she wasn't ready, right? Cause she's been looking forward to this for how long? And so it's just like also the questioning, like we have seen it within the safety report and through community, like uh, kids being questioned about like, oh, like, uh, do you still play with Barbies and this, that, and the other? And you're like, what does this have to do with the care that I am asking from you today? 
you know, and it's because they're assessing us. They are seeing if we are trans enough, if we go along with what they perceive as the correct way to gender a person. Right. And so I think uh, like, as uh, we say, like that's to be, to be trans enough, that, that that's not a thing. Right. And so if we go to our doctor asking for hormones and later change our mind or adjust, that is absolutely fine. And that's the treatment that we wanted. And that's a treatment that we uh, can have. However, that is gate kept from us. I also love the like, like people, like I like to compare it to like anti-abortion and then like depression as like my tooth, right? Like, we over like a lot of folks can walk into a family doctors and walk out with a prescription for antidepressants, which is not a bad thing because people need and deserve medication. But I think it's interesting how there's like hurdles put up for trans people that aren't put up for other things. And a lot of the language around like trans healthcare, if you look at the history of like ab abortion access, it's a mirrored history where every step of the way they're saying you can have an abortion, but like only if you like step through these billion, billion boxes and then maybe. And then we won't support you after. And then if you regret it, we're going to blame you and say that that is part of why abortion shouldn't be legal. And that's the exact same, it's the same ideologies. But actually, I want to throw it, Keegan, over to you um, and see if you have any last thoughts on this question before I move on. Yeah. Um, one, like, as we were talking, one thing that really came up for me um, was like this idea of like what, you know, physicians or practitioners consider like appropriate or good. Like, you know, like I'm someone who I'm in a bigger body, like, you know, when I've been trying for so long to get top surgery and it's just like been such a fucking hassle. And I, a lot of it is like bullshit BMI cutoffs, like, you know, worries about anesthesia and this, that, and the other, but also it's like a lot about my understanding is like a lot of this, a lot of surgeons are worried about like the kind of physical appearance of the chest because it won't be as flat as maybe like a skinnier person, but it's like, I just want a flatter chest. You know what I mean? Like, it doesn't have to be Bart, like Ken flat. Like, I don't care. Like, you know, and even bigger cis dudes, like, typically don't also have flat <laughs> chest either. You know what I'm saying? And it's like, and it's so, so difficult. Like, all these people are telling me, like, oh, this is for your wellness. This is for your health. We're doing this. We have to reject your claim because, like, you know, we just, we just don't think it's safe. And it's like, well, I'm not safe right now with my body, or I don't feel safe in my body. And this will make me feel safer. This will make me feel better. Like, I mean, you know, so many, I've like, talking to so many different people but on so many different ways that's been rejected and like basically streaming the top of my lungs like i want this thing and then but yeah as you said like where it's pathologized like oh this person doesn't actually know what they want and like you know like the young person you mentioned all the earlier like you know like she was so excited for this like intervention that could like you know really shift her quality of life like oh she doesn't know she's too young or this person's you know i'm 25 and people still tell me i'm too young to know what i want i'm like well when am i old enough but then when you're like 60 and you want to transition then people are like oh it's too late if you were really trans, you would have done it a while ago. But like, it sounds like you just don't want to be trans. <laughs> um, so that's just really what came up for me is just like, yeah, like kind of a medical fat phobia and just like those barriers of like what's seen as like aesthetically pleasing or what's considered cosmetic. Like, you know, how many trans femmes like, you know, would want like, you know, breast augmentation surgery, but then, you know, it's not considered, it's not considered like, um, or like, you know, people don't consider it often like a medical thing, but it's like, if this is what's going to keep somebody on this planet, I give give her the titties. You know what I'm saying? Like give it to her. Like, give her the, <laughs> but I also love like like medic. Like I, I want to for, for our audience. I want to name what, what medically necessary care is. And trans healthcare is deemed. And I'm not just talking like top surgery and bottom surgery. I'm also talking electrolysis, laser hair removal, getting rid of these pesky freaking Adam's apples. Um, like face feminization surgery, face masculinization surgery. These are all recognized by international experts as the best practice and medically necessary. So it's not a factor of, you know, trans people just like doing our own thing and saying, oh God, how dare they not cover it? Though that is part of it because they should cover our healthcare. But it is actually like, this is the right medical thing to do. This is also the right not to play the like money card, but it is also cost effective to do. Cause when you don't have it covered, I'm gonna use the example of like trans femmes. Like you've got a bunch of like poor trans women who are having to not only choose between like, like try to pay rent, but are actually intentionally choosing to save what little money they can for FFS, which they're then spending thousands of dollars on while still having to barely like chip by and pay rent every month. And so that actually, in fact, perpetuates the cycle of poverty. When people who are poor are forced to save for medically necessary health care, they're more likely to experience stress, poor mental health, poor physical health, all of those things. So investing in trans health care is actually both medically the right thing to do, socially the right thing to do, and economically a very smart idea that will make everyone's lives better and won't hurt anybody in the interim. There's, so, there's actually... Yeah, there's studies 
that show that for every dollar we invest in gender affirming care, you get between two and five dollars back in economic growth. So there's really no excuse to not fund it except for being okay. afraid of trans people <laughs> and being afraid of trans people being happy. Yeah, and any of the arguments against they're just they're they're red herrings. Like children can consent to medical procedures and all like children have rights of their own. We don't force medication on anybody in any context. Like ah, Ollie, I'm seeing uh eagerness, I think. <laughs> yeah, so I just did something for school with this. So like the for in Ontario, the healthcare consent act uh, specifies that all persons, including minors, are assumed to be capable of making healthcare treatment decisions. And it's not even just like consenting to them, it's just making them. So an active choice in their healthcare, right? Unless it's like deemed incapable, but then that's also like, uh, like splattered with uh, ableism and what is capability, right? And so like, obviously like uh, uh, the law is the law is law, but uh, to know that, right? And so especially in these gender clinics, like, okay, like, yes, we can do this, but like, we know um, it's better outcomes if the family's on board. Sure, absolutely. However, you are treating this patient right now and this patient uh, with like their, their parents are gonna do whatever the parents do, but if this kid can control how they feel about their bodies for a little bit more, like that's gonna benefit them. And just specifically on the topic of like surgeries and whatnot, we think about uh, like these surgeries, like, oh yeah, I'm finally gonna get surgery or like, oh yes, the surgery is covered. However, the doctors that are doing the surgery rarely are uh, a, like trans informed at all, to be honest. Like when I got my top surgery, the surgeon that did mine um, specialized in like middle-aged women plastic surgery. So of course that's the entire space catered to that. And I was just kind of like the sore thumb seek, spit, um, uh, sticking out as well as that same clinic refused they went through all the the they refused somebody uh recently who wanted to get top surgery because they were in a wheelchair right and so we see that constantly and then additionally um a lot of like specifically bottom surgery is only done in like two one place across canada right two and so um and I have someone close to my life who went to do a consultation out in uh, Quebec for a surgery and felt like that the, the head surgeon was transphobic as well as made light of their other health issues, right? So does that give us confidence? So even within those spaces where we are so close to getting the gender affirming care that we need, however, then we feel like uh, powerless within these situations because these doctors just do not, uh, are not informed, are not experts, are not, uh, connected to the trans community, they only do work on trans people. You know, I think there's a stark difference there. Definitely. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna I have, one, I have one last comment myself, and then I'll move on to our next question. I'm doing the like moderator panelist thing. It's really fun. Um, so my my last thing is just, I think it's interesting how you know, if we actually look at the trans health system, it is one of the most underfunded aspects of healthcare. When there's issues in healthcare generally, if, if a doctor messes up, you don't say, oh, we should stop ever prescribing this medication or we should stop ever having, you know, social workers because one social worker fucked up or messed up. You say there is a problem that needs to be regulation and structure and funding. Trans healthcare is that. It is not that, you know, we have a lot of physicians who aren't great. Um, but the biggest thing is that no one has put in the time and energy to make it better. And so there will be issues where folks have bad care. And that bad care is not because trans healthcare shouldn't exist. It's because every single physician hasn't had enough training on trans health, on trans inclusion, et cetera. So now that we've like talked about how terrible healthcare for trans people is, um, I kind of want to shift gears and see, you know, what could we or should we be doing differently? So how do we actually improve healthcare for trans folks in this country? Um, I would love to start. Go ahead, Keegan. Yeah, Keegan, yeah, take it away. I think one is like, I mean, I think all, all healthcare, all like, you know, social service provision in theory should be based on the concept of like informed consent, um, which is like, you know, if you have the, like Ollie just said, like if you have the capacity to understand the given procedure, the given risk and et cetera, et cetera, then you should just be able to have that procedure. And I think that should be the same way. Like so many, you can get a tattoo that like sets that like, I'm like fucking goofy from Mickey, like from the fucking Disneyland and no one's going to stop you. You know what I mean? Like you get on your cheek if you want it. Like, <laughs> um, and like, you know, even if some, like, even if in theory, maybe, you know, you'll regret that tattoo down the road or you're like, oh, I should have mini instead. Like you still have, you still got that tattoo. And I think for something so vital as people's lives, people's wellness is like, should be the same to the same idea. And I know like there's a lot of advocacy in Ottawa um, to get like this, well, the adult version for the youth. It's not looking as cute, but 
for the <laughs> for the older folks, you know, like there's a lot of advocacy to get, you know, a clinic here that was based based on informed consent principles, where you know the process is a bit like it's not perfect, but it's a lot faster than typically historically than it has been, where it's like maybe you have like two or three sessions with like a with a physician or whoever, and then you get your hormones based. That's really only for hormone starts. It's not for like surgery, and it's only for people who are like 18 and older, maybe 17 and older if you're lucky. Um, but like, I think that should just be across the board in general, you know, and, and so many trans people, especially by the time your dysphoria or like your need gets so bad that you finally like put your trauma aside and you go to a physician's office to be like, I really need this intervention. Like, usually it's dire by that point, or like, you know, it's, it's gotten, it's become such a problem and people, you know, spend a lot of time denying themselves their truths. You know what I mean? Like people go years and years be like, top surgery, I don't need top surgery. I'm fine just the way I am, blah, blah, blah. But you know, you're not, you're not fine, but there's all these barriers. There's all these things that make it so hard. Um, and so like by the time people have finally like showed up or presented or been like, I want this thing, I feel like that's really what we need to be like, all right, let's go. You know what I mean? And there's, of course, there are some people who, you know, who will benefit from being able to talk things through. And you know what? I think honestly, that's always an option anyways, right? Like, yeah, they can talk. like, honestly, trans people, we can just do that amongst ourselves. Like, you know what I mean? Like, and it's, and that's what we've been done historically. Like, and we've been up late night on the forums, you know, scrolling through Tumblr, looking at people's top surgery results. Like, I'm talking about top surgery just because I, this you know, an intervention I'm particularly going to be interested in now. But like, you know what I mean? Just like thinking about it for years and years, like, oh, which surgery would I want? You know, what would my recovery look like? Do I want keyhole versus this one? Or should I go to California? Like, we do a lot of thinking, you know what I mean? Trans people are actually very smart. Like not to be like, you know what I mean? Not, <laughs> not to say, you know, like not to be ableist or anything or like kind of put certain IQs on people, but like people know what they want. You know what I mean? And if like, and given all the bullshit that comes with trying to access healthcare, if someone's saying, I want this intervention, you know, we let them know, like, here's what the risks are. Here's what the potential benefits are. What are you looking for? All right, you good? All right, boom, bang. Here's your prescription. I feel like that should just, it should just be that simple. Or like, you know, here's your referral for surgery. They'll contact you, ideally not in like eight years. Like, you know, that would be, be ideal if we could get that done faster. Um, yeah, so just like the idea of like these four percent principles that are actually based on like, if you understand, you get it. Not like, if you understand, I need to verify and then someone else needs to verify and then we'll circle back in six months just to make really sure like that's not a four percent to me. That's bullshit to me. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, Ollie, I, or Riley, either of you jump on it. Yeah, um, I think it's definitely that's definitely part of it. I think there's three things that we need to focus on. The first is definitely the informed consent models. Um, when you focus on that instead of proving someone's trans and you're only focusing on making sure they understand the risks of what they're going to go through, um, you create a system that embraces trans people and wants them to grow and succeed and be healthy instead of, you know, further alienating them, patholo pathologizing them and making them feel wrong for accessing care that's specifically only there for them. Um, but part of that also comes through um, defining gender affirming care as medically necessary in all contexts, because we can only have these informed consent models if we do that, if we see it as not cons uh, cosmetic, but as life saving. And with that, we can also just uh, address the systemic discrimination that we talked about earlier. If it's assumed that everyone who walks in the door is seeking medically necessary care, then there is no question that someone will be denied because they are a person of color or they have a disability or they're neurodivergent. That will no longer be a question because there is no potential step that they could be skipped over. And I think one thing that goes very much under discussed is that our models of trans healthcare are all focused on dysphoria and trans suffering, when euphoria is a much better indicator of success and happiness in what someone needs. Um, a friend of mine, a trans woman once said, you know, dysphoria told me something was wrong, but euphoria told me what was right. And that comes to things like we talked about earlier, how many trans women and trans feminine people are denied. They'll go on S or they'll go on E and then they will have breast development up to Tanner scale two, and they will automatically be denied any breast augmentation. Um, not only is the Tanner system trash, like using BMI for top surgery and any other surgeries, um, it's been misappropriated and it creates a system in which once you hit that mark, regardless if you are still feeling dysphoric, 
someone else has determined that no you shouldn't feel the historic anymore because you've hit a number that i think is acceptable no if we're truly focused on gender affirming care being the life-saving intervention that it is to help people live their best life then why are we caring about a arbitrary number that some cisgender person decided on mm -hmm. instead of focusing on the happiness of the person who's receiving that care if they still need as we said earlier, give them the titties if they need bigger titties. I was like waiting for give my moment. Titties. Give trans girls titties. Give trans girls titties. It's not that hard. Yeah. <laughs> like the yeah, but it is like I think you know I, it's it's like there are you know people regret surgeries, but people regret like like the, the barriers trans people have informed consent because no trans person hasn't googled both what are the best top surgery results and what are the scary tops like that is things that people always are doing and yes certain mistakes happen but those mistakes are not the system those are anomalies within a chronically underfunded system yeah. ollie what are your thoughts i was thinking just like on the informed consent model like uh i think also because we uh as trans folks most like i have been told by a doctor being like you probably know more than i do right now and that's not reassuring, you know, like the first time I asked for testosterone, my doctor was like, yeah, sure, no problem. Let's start tomorrow. And I was like, I need some other things. I read on the internet that this was a long process. So I wanted to like get ahead of it. And she was like, sure. So she wrote in my notes that I paused on my transition. And I was like, no, nope, pause medically, maybe. I didn't even start medically, so I don't know how I could pause it. But like uh, that, the concept of like, yeah, like equating transition to transness, but like, also, I within uh, like I I know when I asked her questions later, she didn't have the answers for me. So I don't know how she could have given me the entire informed consent when her herself didn't have everything, right? And so I think that's something that like again shouldn't be uh, done with like oh um, oh I don't the two doctors don't know. So again, they push off again. Speaking from the the youth advocacy perspective, pushing them off to a gender clinic where they have to wait months and like. For a teenager compared to a mid twenty person compared to somebody in their fifties, months change like the, the 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 length of a month is so different, you know. And so I think something for for cis people specifically, I'm going to talk to parents is to like question, like uh, question what is being like done in the system. Like if you need to bring your kid constantly to a hospital to be treated for their gender, like that teaches the kid that they're sick right you're going to a hospital as a 13 year old for so long why constantly more tests but you're still on blockers like what's the point you know so like to understand like you can do your own research as well and question and be linked to the trans community even if you're not right like i will absolutely always talk to a parent who's concerned or this that and the other and i think as keegan mentioned like you don't need to go to a doctor first find community first we can help you like there's no reason to bring a nine-year-old to the doctor constantly right unless like there is something that is medically pressing but for the gender identity most of the time they just want maybe want to go by a different name pronoun and express themselves differently there's no need to be like all right we need to start blockers now and like they do feel that stress right and then we can talk about the, the blockers and then also question if your child was cis would that doctor be treating them the same way right specifically with trans kids they get asked to ask these invasive questions asked to show off their surgery scars when they're in a completely different department that has nothing to do with it like i have been told about a child who was asked to show their top surgery scars in endocrinology and for those who don't know what endocrinology is it has to do with like doctors dealing with hormones so what has what what is it that, that doctor need to see that person's chest right when they're dealing with the hormones it's pure curiosity which is incredibly invasive and this child did not feel as though they could say no right because they are in this power dynamic and especially if you would know as a child that the only care you're going to get is at this clinic then yeah. you're going to your best not to like get on the bad side of these doctors however like that that's so that just elevates that power dynamic so i know for like parents like being that support like it, it, I know sometimes the def definition of support can be different for trans youth versus trans versus the parents of said youth and to ask like how, how can I be more supportive for you in your mind to your kid um instead of being well the doctor said this so that's what we're going to go with that's what's assumed right I've been told multiple times by kids being told I can't start anything until 16 and I was like that's not written anywhere 
that's a lie. And they're like, but that's what? And I was like, that's a lie. That's what maybe they feel most comfortable with. And that's only because that's what they've dealt with or has been accepted, right? If you want it at 13 to start hormones, when an average person is are going through puberty, having these hormones to your body, and you've been on blockers and you know the system, there I don't see a reason for them not to allow you on that, right? And so it's just to be like questioning critically, right? Uh, we don't pause every cis kid's puberty because they're not mentally prepared. Who is really so I'm hearing like, I'm hearing par parents like a trans kid coming out isn't always a crisis unless they tell you it's a crisis. And it's not always a physician go to community first. But just so generally, I'm going to move on to our last question. But I think, you know, where do we go? Informed consent. I've heard better training for physicians, uh, quicker pathways to care, getting folks access to their hormones and essentially like taking all the barriers as much as we can out of the way. Now, as we come to our last eight minutes, um, I wonder for our audience, you know, what, what do you hope, you know, what could they be doing to, to advance this fight or to move this forward? We know trans healthcare is not where we need it to be. What, would, what could folks do in their own lives, in their own advocacy, in their own civic engagement to put trans health on the agenda? Or what does solidarity with trans people look like? We have a federal election coming up. I think this is a great opportunity to, you know, ask your local candidates, like, what are you doing for trans healthcare? Like, what is what is your party's plan? The spoiler alert is, it's not a lot. <laughs> I mean, I guess it depends. It depends. Only on one federal like, political party mentioned gender affirming care in their platform. You know what I mean? Like, is that a thing that's on your mind? Like, if you're a social worker, or you know, like the College of Social Workers, you're I, like you're expected to do professional development in your career, and like I feel like there, I see. In my inbox, I'm constantly seeing there's this there's this credit class you can take. Here's like a 30 minute thing on the weekend you can do like so the information's out there. A lot of the stuff is free. A lot of like the college will pay for it or your workplace will pay for it. You have professional development money. Invest, invest in trans people. Like invest your knowledge and also like bother people to bad conversion therapy because what the fuck? Like why didn't that happen? You know like. That's something we can ask the liberals. It's very intense. We're getting real political, and I'm sorry <laughs> the organizers are stressed. But I'm just, I'm just saying, I'm just saying that could have happened a long time ago, and it hasn't. So that's just what comes to mind, top of mind for me, but yeah. as like a politically minded person. Yeah. You're absolutely right, and we have to remember because we live in a country in which our healthcare is publicly run. Policy only changes when you vote. It only changes in your vote. If you want your publicly run health care to include gender affirming care, to include more trans voices and to be more trans friendly, then you need to vote for parties and people who want to change those policies and have made it a part of their experience and part of their platform. And I have been very lucky in my political life to be involved in campaigns where either the candidate has a trans child or is an incredibly strong ally that does his best to lift up trans voices specifically and step back and recognize, I don't know what the hell I'm talking about. So I'm going to shut up and let you talk because at the end of the day, no matter how strong our allies are, we're our only advocates at the end of the day. And if our needs aren't being net, met, then we need to be loud about it because no one's going to care if we're not loud and we're not assholes about it. And that's our responsibility at the end of the day, as much as it shouldn't be our responsibility because we didn't build the system. The system is what it is. We're our only advocates. And if we don't vote for change, then change is never going to come. Definitely. Ollie, how about you? I retweet on both of what they just said. Um, but I think like just, I, yeah, like, putting understanding like when we vote like people like to vote strategically people like to vote for themselves right but like it vote for your community right vote for people who like if our health care and our gender friendly health care gets better your health care gets better like God. straight up doctors are more informed they're <laughs> like there's some doctor doctor is not going to be more weird about gender won't be weird about your gender or my gender that's good for all of us it's like just a personal anecdote. I had to go to the ER for nothing that was emergency related in New Brunswick because they don't have clinics out there. They do not have walk-in clinics. Like it's not a thing. And obviously I don't have a doctor. I had to go into the ER and my, my gender was assumed. And like, uh, as a non-binary person, I always think that's funny, like which way they'll go or what they'll do or what have you. Um, and then I was asked a quite an evasive question about my genitals. And I was like, oh, I don't have that. And like the doctor just paused for a second. And he's like, have you had the surgery? And I was like, nope. And then he was like, okay, I only asked because uh, 
there's a, a high spread of gonorrhea right now. And I was like, cool, you could have led with that. You know, there's so other ways for you. To, so heads up, everybody, there's gonorrhea in New Brunswick. Um, <laughs> I uh, sorry, <laughs> um, but like they could have led and they could have communicated so much more. And I think that's such a big thing with our healthcare system is that doctors do not communicate. They assume they know more than you, um, which is something that is in place with them in the system. Like to have informed consent means communication means that they have to learn how to communicate with you and for you to understand. Like these people work for us, as Riley was saying. Like this is a publicly funded thing. These people work for us, and we are entitled to know what is written about us with our medical records. How like what is going on with our health and for them to be able to communicate that with us. Amazing. We are now coming up on our time. Um, so I, I think I, I want to take a moment now to, to thank the three of you for your brilliant thoughts and reflections throughout our time together today. Uh, I also want to, of course, thank Safety for making this happen alongside Capital Pride. Uh, if you don't know Safety, you can Google them. It will try to autocorrect it to Safety. Uh, it is spelled S-A-E-F-T-Y, and if you add Ottawa, it will be your first Google result. Um, I would also recommend that folks do indeed, we've talked a little bit about the federal election, but check out what their parties and your local candidates are saying on 2S LGBTQ issues and on gender affirming care, health, and trans rights more generally. Um, one of the biggest things folks can do is, you know, support local community organizations, advocate with trans communities and community leaders, and ask your candidates the hard questions and find out where they stand and what they plan to do about trans, gender diverse rights, health, and well-being in this country. Um, I think I will leave it at that. Um, but again, thank you to our wonderful panelists. Uh, thank you, Riley, Keegan, and Ollie. Um, and thank you, Capital Pride. And thank you all to our phenomenal attendees for joining us this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good one, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thanks so much, y'all. Have a good day.